probably, I, I'm Paul Ferris. I'm here to talk a little bit about being a, a pinball artist and pinball art in general. Uh, you might wonder why I have a slide up of uh, a wrestling coach um, working with his wrestler right now, but th this goes back to uh, 1975, and that's what I was doing at the time. Um, I'm often asked, whatever got me into pinball art? And I, it was not kind of the normal path that I would think you would expect, but um, at the time I was a, uh, since 1975, I, I'd been coaching and teaching um, at a high school in Chicago area, and I was a head wrestling coach and the art teacher. But I was also uh, producing fine art paintings and selling them in the summers and, um, and through galleries and art shows. And uh, just by coincidence, some that got mentioned to um, Mr. Billy O'Donnell Jr., who was the son of the owner of Valley, or the president of Valley. And um, just coincidentally, they were looking for a someone who could come in and establish an in-house art department, possibly, as this company was about to really grow. It was a, this was around the time of, for those of you who are familiar with some of the games, but around, around the time of Wizard, um, which was one of the first licensed pinball games. Um, so they approached me about coming in there to be an artist, number one, and, to then, and also then to maybe develop an art department in-house. So, because um, at the time, Almost all pinball art by all four manufacturers was being done by one by one design firm in Chicago called Ad Poster, <clears throat> and they did a nice job. But, but what Bally wanted to do was to get a little bit more of a unique look to their artwork, and they had an artist there at the time. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with his games. His name is Dave Christensen. He had done Fireball, and uh, he had done Wizard, and uh, was at the time that I came there was working on Captain Fantastic. So. Um, Move ahead. This, this is the kind of work I was doing at that time. Those are actually my kids now. Uh, and uh, my daughter is now in her 40s. My, grand, my uh, son is now 45. So this is a while back. But this is the kind of work I was doing. Um, oh, There's a little, a little bit of a, a delay on the button here, so I won't want to rush through it. Uh, these are some examples of the paintings I was doing and selling at, uh, at, at the art shows. And actually, it was going so well that I was considering. Uh, possibly even teaching and, and doing this full time. But I was only 26 at the time, three kids. It's, it's kind of a bold move um, to just become a fine artist and support yourself and the family. So it was, um, I was considering it. Um, as I said, then um, Billy O'Donnell gave me a call, asked if I'd be interested in coming in and, and talking to him about pinball, being a pinball artist. Now, I didn't know anything about pinball. I mean, in Chicago, we didn't even see pinballs. As Roger Sharp mentioned earlier, they weren't even legal. So we didn't, you know, I was only aware of some, um, just seeing some pinball art that was done at the time. And it was definitely a very uh, stylized, cartoon style art that I, from what, most of what I saw. Um, so I did go and talk to Billy, I talked to uh, the, uh, Ross Shear, who was the marketing director at the time. And what I took in to show my artwork was work like this, fine artwork. And I also took in um, some drawings I had done as an as a eighth grader or a freshman in high school, that were of football players and athletes and the monsters. You know, all, I was a big fan of all the, all the famous monsters. So that's what I took in to show them for my interview. Um, you know, I, again, I wasn't even sure I wanted to even do this, but I wanted to come in and talk to them. Well, when I did go in and look at the, um, the games that were being done, I saw Dave Christensen's uh, Fireball, and I saw his work on Wizard, and that gave me some encouragement that they really wanted to do something in, 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 with a different look to it and a much more, um, I guess, with a, you know, the, the term fine art is what I was hoping to try to apply, uh, apply to the work and uh, it got me a little bit excited about possibly doing it. Um, so um, I did, actually, I, I kind of took, turned the job down a couple times because I was just kind of wavering about doing it, but then my wife, who is uh, much better at forethought than I am, um, said this is kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity, you know, this, this may be a great time to do this. And she didn't know anything about pinball, but she knew a lot about business. So, so anyway, um, I, I did make the move to Valley. Um, was, I worked as an artist for a year, um, doing some artwork. Some of the games that I see on the floor here are actual games that I did. One of them is Knight Rider, which was a, um, truck driver theme that, um, I, again, I don't have pictures of every game I've done. I have some, though, that I'll show, go through and show you. Um, but um, Night Runner actually has, as one of the, the 
truck driver on the game is actually was my assistant wrestling coach when I uh, left coaching. I, I immortalized him as a, a truck driver. And so, uh, and I, I've, I've used my family members and I've used friends and my brother, um, a variety of people at different times on these uh, different pinball machines that I did. So this is actually when I was, um, I decided to look more artistic and grow a beard. And um, this is the painting I was doing for the game called Paragon. Um, that's one of my favorite games. Um, you know, again, I'm a, I was a wrestling coach and a wrestler, so I, I, I used myself as the barbarian on top of the, the lion creature, and then that's actually my wife. Um, and you'll see a little bit more of that later on, but um, she was actually um, good sport enough to be my model for this. Um, and so she, they, she, now we have, um, she's the lady on Paragon everybody wants me to introduce them to. So, uh, and uh, she is not real comfortable with that, but it, it's, it's all good. Uh, all right, this is just a little, uh, I, I usually bring these to these shows, but I didn't this time, but they're like little postcards that I put together just to kind of show samples of some of the work I've done. Uh, and they, they range in, this, in terms of um, time period from about 1975, which is, if you look up, or 1977, I think was eight ball, and um, all the way up to uh, the latest one there, the most recent one there was the Golden Eye piece, which is a James Bond piece. Um, so that's, that's, this is just a sample of different pieces I've done over the years. Um, and these are all, for the most part, these are all painted pieces. The only one that isn't is 8-Ball. And I bring that up now because I'm going to show you a piece in a few minutes that um, represented a total change in the way artwork was created and screen printed um, for the industry. Um, if you look at 8-Ball, again, if you're familiar with some of the older games like Knight Rider and in my case, Evil Knievel, I see Evil Knievel Glass sitting back there. Um, those were all done in the conventional style of art that we used to do. We, we would do a very elaborate ink drawing, and then, and I hate to use this term, but almost like a coloring book, we would fill in all the different colors as, as a separate screen printed process. It was all done by hand. Well, um, someone came to me about trying to come up with a different idea about printing, and it wouldn't work for what we wanted to do, but it gave me an idea about creating four color process screen printed backlines. It's four color processes, for, for those that don't know, that's just the way they print magazines and books, and um, it, it uses the four different dots of cyan, magenta, black, and yellow, and when those dots all combine in the right way, you have a beautiful full color piece of artwork that could look like an oil painting, could be like an airbrush piece, I mean, it's, it's anyway, it, it was, it was a great idea for an artist. Is the reason I wanted to do it because it gave us much more um, flexibility and much more capability of doing some very elaborate and more more beautiful pieces. I thought um, the Valley loved it because it cost it saved them millions of dollars over the years in terms of the cost of producing the glasses. So they were very kind to me for doing this. But my motivation was really about um, art, and that was the whole motivation for it. I never even. It, just a nice side benefit that the um, cost came down so so much because of the uh, the process. So this was a ball. Uh, going back in those days, we you know uh, many times pinball artists. I was talking to Roger Sharp about this earlier. We, we we weren't so bold as to try to create a new art form or a new art genre or a new art look. We were basically trying to reflect pop culture. So, and that's why licensed games, when they came along, were so, so worked so well. But as, as artists, just in the, um, in the realm of, of what we did every day with the, with the um, where the themes came up from our, from our own ideas, um, we tried to reflect what was going on at the time. And at this time, a lot of the artwork that was being produced um, in some of the best, by some of the best illustrators in the world was being done on, on album covers. You know, there used to be a large format, if you remember the vinyl, uh, that were done, and some of these, especially rock bands, were some just great artwork that were done for those. Um, and so then you had you know, current TV shows and things like that that reflected the time. So you, like Roger was saying earlier, if you look back at the artwork that was done during this era, you can kind of see what, where the culture was too. Um, again, when I did the uh, Night Rider game, that was, um, we, that was during the CD craze, and some of you probably don't even remember that, but you're too young to remember it, but it's when everybody was getting into CD radios and everybody had to have a hand on it. So, that, so it, it just reflected that in the game. So 8-Ball, eight, eight um, the interesting thing about 8-Ball for me, when I look at it, this was the number one selling pinball game of all time until Adam's family eclipsed that uh, 
not too, not too long ago, actually. Um, well, it's been a while. But, uh, but in terms of pinball, she just had the record for a number of sales of over 20,000 games. And it's a game that I wanted to hurry up and get done so I could get on to my Lost World game that I had, was going to be the first four-color um, painted uh, back glass that was going to be in, uh, hit, hit the market. And I really wanted to get on to that one, so I was very excited. So I did this one um, based on um, uh, Norm Clark was a designer at the time, the director of the pinball designers, and he really wanted, he said, pool games are always good, you know, put it, and Roger even went into that earlier today. But, um, so this is a pool thing, but we kind of picked up on the Happy Days, um, you know, environment without really using the, um, the characters. It is a similar looking character to the Fonzie character, but it's not identical. Um, and, and again, but I, I did hear that um, Fonzie was quoted, or uh, Winkler, Henry Winkler was quoted as saying that he knew he really made it in the world because he saw himself on a pinball game. But it, it really wasn't, uh, that wasn't the total intention. But it was, it was a uh, facsimile uh, of that character, that kind of a character. Anyway, the game was very successful. Last one I did that used the line art solid screen print um, system. And again, this screen, this game, which doesn't look all that colorful, has about 14 different screens to it and operations. And for you, for you folks that have been doing this amazing job of, of rehabbing some of these games that I've seen, I don't know how you do it. But it's, they're just, I walk in that room out there and I'm just stunned at how, how pristine these games look. And how, you know, I don't, I don't know, it's a very tough thing to kind of recondition the glass and, and, and make it look like it did originally. But, um, but this system relied, relied on four, or not four, but this one, 14 different layers of color. So, this is okay. This was the little test we did. We still have this. It's only about 12 by 12 in size, but we, we had to show management how this process was going to work. You know, we, it sounds great. It sounds like it save money. Only doing, only doing four operations at a time um, to, to create a whole class. But this was a little sample sheet I did to kind of test the different possibilities. And uh, I put in text in there. I did a little drawing that kind of became the subject for Lost World. Um, actually, Lost World was inspired by an artist named Frank Frazetta, who has uh, since passed away, but was one of the top sword and sorcery and heroic fantasy type of artists that was uh, doing more artwork at the time. And so I knew it was kind of a, an up and coming popular theme, although it was different from what was being done at the time in, in non pinball machines. Anyway, this, this particular piece actually has um, the the four different, we, we screen printed it, tried to test piece, I actually have the glass that we used. It's just not a, it's so cheesy now compared to what we, we ended up with, but um, it, was, it was nice to, to see the process would work. We had to make sure it would work in terms of production and manufacturing. Um, as Gary Stern was talking about earlier, you, you're still manufacturers. You've got to be able to reproduce it, re repeat it effectively, uh, make sure the process uh, can be held um, uh, consistent. Okay, there, there's the Lost World class as it finally appeared. Um, this is one of my favorite games. It's not necessarily one of my favorite pieces of art um, in terms of the sophistication of the art or what, it, what, uh, what I would have liked to have done, but it, it was done to make it work with this new process and work effectively. Um, and I, you know, for that reason, you know, it's, it's, in terms of pinball history, it's very important in terms of what it represents. Um, so that's why I tend to really, really like it. Uh, and this is, this is the one I was trying to get to when I was doing eight ball, and you know it, it was they, they knew eight ball was going to be a success. I should also mention that eight ball was the first, I believe, it was our first full production game as an all electrical electronic game as opposed to electric mechanical. So that was that helped its sales quite a bit. But it was um, this one um, was also um, all electric. Electronic as well, <clears throat> but it was our second one. And the runs in those days for this, this was this was a game they produced. I think it was ten or twelve thousand of these, and they actually cut it short because they had another license game they had to get into. Um, next, next. So this one they was surprisingly popular, and they would have uh, probably liked to run more. But this is when this industry was really picking up and going, um, you know, going great guns. Um, okay, then this was my next piece, which was our next license game, um, Playboy. This one does have a combination of um, the solid screen printing technique and the four color process. Um, doing this game was, um, to say the least, was um, a lot of fun. Uh, and I probably should elaborate a little bit. When I talk to my, I'm a high, you know, been a high school art teacher for 10 years now, and I do show them this, some of these slides, 
of course, they all want to know about all that, about this one. Um, and I will say that in the beginning, my, my concept that I sent to, we sent to Hefner um, was rejected. And that was kind of hard. I've only been in the business for two years, and um, already I'm getting a major guy rejecting the art. But it wasn't because he didn't like the quality of the art or the idea. Because I had kind of the Playboy lifestyle and the clubs and, you know, kind of like an advertisement for Playboy. He didn't, he didn't want that. He wanted to be the man. He wanted to be the Playboy. He wanted to be in the middle of the two women. Um, he even told me which women I had to use. Um, and when, when we went out to, again, this is part of the good stuff. When we went out to California, we got to go to the mansion, and, um, and I had the, um, he took us on a tour of the place, and, you know, I watched uh, Bill Cosby's down playing tennis on the tennis court, and all these, you know, peacocks running around, beautiful women all over, it just, you know, so, you know, I've been out of teaching for two years, and here I am at the Playboy Mansion with Hugh Hefner taking me on a private tour. I was a little overwhelmed, to say the least. And then I had the good or the bad manners to play pinball with him and beat him in pinball. And, um, I didn't realize he considered himself to be, you know, quite the pinball player. And uh, of course, everybody supported that that, uh, that myth. But um, anyway, he got to. Uh, he had a lot of input on this game, and to the point where he, they were building a casino in Atlantic City at this time. And one of the complaints was that Hugh Hefner was so involved in the design of the pinball game that he didn't have time to worry about the casino. You know, and that, and that was a pretty major deal at that time. But he really loved to play pinball. You've seen, I think, if you were here earlier, uh, it was Jim Shelbert showed the, um, the some of the, the, the movies of the game house he has, and um, and people playing pinball and all the variety of games they have. Um, even at that time, they had quite a few. Um, but to this now, um, and I, when I was one of our visits there, he had the girl on the right, the blonde, who was his girlfriend at the time, um, come down and play the piano so we could hear the Playboy jingle and, and then talk about you know how she thought she looked at her game. And she was um, she thanked me for her cleavage. Um, but um, so anyway, it was, it was pretty exciting time. Four times out there to, to do one game. Um, might have been excessive, but it was certainly worth worth the time. Uh, so this is this is that game room that was in that uh, piece a little bit earlier. But that's my artwork hanging over his mantle of the game room. So I, as far as I know, it's still it's still there. Because this was actually taken by some of you might know Kevin O'Connor, who's another art pinball artist that uh, I hired back in the day and um, went on to. He actually did work on the second Playboy pinball game that was done. And while he was there, he took this picture for me. And gave it to me, so that's that was what it, what it looked like at the time. Okay, this is that Paragon piece you saw earlier that I was working on in black and white. And this is what I'm going to show you now. Pretty much going to be some of the artwork that I've done. Some of you probably, a lot of you uh, are familiar with them. If not, it will be maybe the first time you've seen some of these. But um, and I, what I'm showing you primarily is the, is the artwork itself, not the games taken as a photograph of the back glass. And, um, but this this is a Paragon piece. It's a pretty large painting. And it, uh, as I said, represents my wife and I, and uh, at the time, uh, with uh, it, it's sort of the heroic fantasy theme. But it was based on the Lost World characters that I created on the Lost World game. So we came out with our first wide body. Uh, it was a lot of fun to do. Obviously, it's a theme. I really enjoyed the theme. Uh, I don't know if anybody watches Game of Thrones or anything, but uh, I'm a huge. Uh, fan of that kind of genre. So this was pretty popular, popular theme at the time as well. Um, okay, this one, this is actually not, this is not going so much chronologically now. I'll jump around a little bit here. Um, I actually have these pieces in because these are some of my, my favorite pieces that I did. Um, this one, a lot of people don't know what this one looks like because on the, this is Phantom of the Opera. It was done for um, Dadies Pinball, uh, the date, I'm trying to remember the date. Uh, early 80s, I think maybe 1988, maybe 85. What is it? 87. 87, thank you. <laughs> um, I knew it was somewhere in that area. The, the, the cool thing about this painting for me was that uh, Joe Cam Camacow had contacted me. It's the first piece um, that I did with Dady East, and uh, Joe was very enthused about it. And, and the one thing about it was, this is around the time that the Broadway play had just started to come out and Phantom of the Opera sort of was becoming, again, sort of a pop culture theme. But they obviously did use at the time did not want to pay for a license, nor did they need to because what they had me do was read the book. The, 
book is public domain, so I read the book, and I did my version of Phantom of the Opera. And, um, so this is it, and again, this is the unmasked Phantom. You don't walk up to the game at an arcade. I, actually, I don't think there's one on the floor here. I don't know if I've seen anybody that had one here today. Um, and it gets one of my favorite games, so I was kind of saddened by that. But, um, but the way we did it was, um, there's a mask in front of the uh, Phantom's face that you see as you approach the game, as you play the game, but as certain things in the game intensify uh, and the points go up, all of a sudden these lights behind the face go on and they make the mask disappear and you see the unmasked Phantom. So my painting in my um, studio, that still hangs in my studio, um, is uh, this version of it. Okay, that's an oil painting. And the other thing that's kind of interesting about it, and I'll show you in a second, that, how we sometimes take you behind the curtain a little bit and show you how we create these things that are not from an actual um, movie where we can get photos that are released to us or a TV show. This one had to come out of my head, but it wasn't totally out of my head because that's my daughter is the Christine Diane character. She was 20 at the time, a ballet dancer herself, so that's her as the ballet dancer. She's the, the blonde at the bottom. Um, the uh, And then all the phantom characters, um, were actually my sons. Now, I, yeah, my sons don't look like that, but um, they obviously stood in his model. So the, uh, there it is with the mask on. That's probably the way you, most of you have always seen the game. Uh, so that was this was a lot of fun to do for me. I really enjoyed it because it was taking, it kind of taking my imagery of the uh, of the book and kind of putting it to um, to an oil painting. And then this is how we do it. That's my daughter, that's my son's, and if you, this is my son in the bathrobe, it became a skull-faced uh, uh, phantom at a, at a masquerade party, and, and so on. And my daughter in her prom dress, and uh, so that I, my kids were great sports, and so was my wife, <laughs> having to do some of this stuff. But, um, and then this is, again, more of a, here's my son with the mask on, uh, and I actually made the mask just to fit the, uh, the, the style of the mask, because that's not like any phantom mask that has ever been used. Uh, Ed Sabula, Gary Stern, uh, they became the, on the play field, they became the uh, owners of the Opera House. Um, again, my daughter's picture, she was on the play field. That was, the fellow in the Falcon shirt was actually uh, her ex-boyfriend, so we just, we just cross him out now on the painting. Um, uh, the, uh, and that's my youngest son up there at the top left hand. For that was actually uh, used as the phantom, the pose for the phantom on the playfield. So we get a little help by t taking uh, photo references and, and then working from there. Uh, this is a game. Um, how many are familiar? Anybody familiar with this game at all? Okay, you know the story behind it a little bit. Uh, I, mean, so I did. A, this was a game where I, I had left Valley, started my own business as a freelance artist and, uh, and doing work for the for the pinball business, but also for video games for uh, any other kind of um, illustration work that came along. And I had some pretty neat contracts outside of the game business. <clears throat> this one, one that, where I was approached by Williams to do a game called Grand Lizard that did get produced. I did the, I designed the play field, the cabinet, the whole package, and then did the back class. They, they accepted the uh, sketches, they liked it. And uh, I did a full painting. And then right near production, they um, changed the display position. They're gonna to go to a different display and require different spacing. And, and rather than go back and try to redo this, um, Python Angelo redid the back glass. So this one I think only appeared on, I think there's only maybe 25 glasses that were ever printed um, of this one. Um, and I, I kind of liked it, again, that's, that's, that's my son is the, um, who was a, you know, really an all-state wrestler in high school, so I used him as my heroic, uh, figure in the center, and then my daughter with the, she did not green and doesn't have a long tail, but she was my model for the, the, the serpent lady at the top. And, um, so I really enjoyed this piece. It was just sort of sad in a way that it never got uh, produced or manufactured, but I still have the painting and, um, and still kind of enjoyed doing it. Um, and they were great to work with. It just was a, uh, uh, and it was, under, it was done under a very tight schedule. I remember that. We had about a month to do this, and normally we would take six to eight weeks to do a full pinball machine in terms of from scratch, from the sketches to the final final product. And in this case, um, I did it in a month, and it was, it was pretty intense, so um, it's the sort of sad never got to be used. Okay, this one, we just had the 25th anniversary of Xenon um, up at Expo. I don't know if anybody was up there, there. okay. Um, it was a great time for, for us because uh, 
We got to see Suzanne Chiani, who, if you know the story about Xenon, she was the voice of Xenon. And Xenon was historic in terms of pinballs because it was the first female voice on a pinball machine. And um, just this is an amazingly creative lady who did a lot of um, like signature logo, sound logos for Columbia Films and for Coca-Cola and for a variety of high-level clients. But she also um, agreed to do the voice for uh, pinball. She went over to Broadway Arcade, um, kind of studied the way people play pinballs and sort of the gestures they do. And so some of the mm and ahs and some of the sounds that she produced um, and on her voice came from watching actual people play pinball because she didn't have a clue before that. So she went over to Broadway Arcade and got, got an education. Um, but anyway, this was um, a fun piece to do. It was a double glass. It had an infinity box on it. We used that on some another game, the Space Invaders. We used that on. Um, it was on a, a standard size game. Um, and it was just sort of a, and this was done way, you know, the, the, the tall, eight foot tall, uh, large eyed blue lady was way before Avatar ever even was in Jim Cameron's head. So I, um, it, was kind of, it was kind of neat to see that kind of evolve into a, uh, a different style uh, for current movies. And, um, anyway, so this, this was a pretty successful game. It, the biggest thing about it, as most of you know, it had the transport tube that went, went from one side of the playfield to the other, which it, in those days was pretty, pretty far out. Okay, that's, uh, that is that is the lady on Paragon in, in full dress. Um, and this is this was about 1990 when I took this. Um, again, I, just to kind of show kids, this is when I still was a college wrestling coach at the time. So, uh, but that's par the Paragon painting with us. Okay, that has nothing to do with pinball, but during all this time that I was freelancing and working at most of the time when I was still working at Valley, I coached wrestling. I don't know how, I'm, I'm thinking back on it now, I don't know how I did it, I don't know how I worked the time. Because I also, because to me, wrestling is like somebody's t game of tennis or golf for other people. I, I wrestle because I, it's my physical activity. I still do it. So uh, the, so at this time, I was coaching college kids, and, um, and this is this, this is all going on at the same time I was doing this artwork. Luckily, as a freelancer, your schedule is pretty flexible, so I was able to work it in and, and survive the the, uh, the workouts. With some, sometimes these college kids are 285 pounds and are gorillas, so it's uh, it's pretty challenging. So, it was, but it was fun. All right, this is a game um, again, one of my favorite pieces of art. Um, the game did okay. Um, John Borg is actually the designer of this game, but he's done a lot of a lot of very successful games for uh, Data East and Sega. Um, but the, the fun thing about this was, um, this movie, uh, Frankenstein, was with Robert, it's Robert De Niro as the uh, Frankenstein character in the center there. They did a lot of research on the, the, the book and then tried to recreate the time period that the book was actually written in, which is in the 1800s. And nobody really had done that. The, the modern version of the version from the 1930s of Frankenstein was much more updated. So, I mean, all the sets and all the costumes were very uh, true to the book. So that was why it was fun. And it was, I just liked the way the, the art came out. We had a lot of characters to work with. Um, again, more of the movie poster style of art. A lot more airbrush and that's probably in some of my earlier work. But uh, again, one of, one of my favorite pieces to work on. That one hangs in my studio right now as well. And this is one that uh, later ones I did, one of the last ones I did. Um, it's the uh, golden eye piece of the James Bond, the first James Bond movie that uh, Pierce Brosnan did. When you worked at Data East, especially for Data East, I mean, I never really worked at Data East, I worked for them and doing several commissions. But when you worked for, for them, especially in the, in the later years, they were almost every game was becoming a license game. They really were, and Gary talked about it earlier, I mean, they really believed that licensing is a good thing. Um, so, you know, again, as long as it's a good license, you always do run the risk uh, of something happening, and that's why it's a little reminiscent of the Evil Knievel class I looked at back there. Um, back in those days, after we did the Evil Knievel coin hop game, they, um, Montgomery Wards actually wanted to do a home pinball version of that game. And I don't know if this is in the, um, you know, the lore of uh, pinball development at this point, but so we did, we did a modified version of that game, and it was about ready to come out in production, and Evil Knievel, who probably some of you don't even remember who he is, but he was a daredevil motorcyclist, he went to, took a baseball bat to his manager and, and beat the crap out of him, and um, that became, you know, news. 
certainly didn't spread as fast as things spread today, but it got around pretty quickly. So we suddenly had to do a, re a reboot of the artwork, and Kevin O'Connor came up with a version of a game called Galaxy Ranger that replaced the uh, uh, Evil Can Evil piece. So the idea of a, a license has got to have enough lifespan to it that if not, so nothing happens in the time from the time you start the piece till the time you produce it, and, time to, and it gets out of the marketplace, and that is a little risky. There are things that can happen. And there's one that were helping with us uh, firsthand. Uh, this is a game that was painted and played two play fields were done. It was actually a dual play field pinball game. How many of you have ever seen it on production in, in the field? You, you actually saw it or you saw the one in round. Okay. And that's the only place that it ever went. <laughs> uh, it, was, uh, it was never produced. But it was for the movie Total Recall that Arnold Schwarzenegger was in and um, Sharon Stone. And, um, so that's the artwork for a game that, again, it took the same amount of time. They, they, you know, I got paid, so that's all good. But when they make a decision sometimes about a game, that if it doesn't test right or if it, it doesn't, um, you know, in those days it's just kind of a, will this work? Is it too big of, it was two, it was two conjoined pinball play fields of two cabinets joined into one back class, which I mean, when you're fighting for square footage at a location, it's, it's, a, it's a, a kind of a, a tough thing. So it never got made. Um, there it is with the logo on it. Um, and that was in the back. So that's what it would have been like if we, if we ever had it appear. Uh, I also did another, I did several of the Batman games for uh, Stern. And we did, the first one I did uh, was produced. The second one, it was a second Tim Burton movie. And I forgot, it's the one that had Danny DeVito in it. But I remember I did a full back class for that. Um, did a play field, but that one never got, never got produced. And I'm not sure why. But when you're a freelancer, you take the job, you do the work, you know, you, you, you turn it in and they, they, it's up to them to do what they, they want with it, you know. But I still have the painting for that, that one too. Um, this one was a kind, of a, kind of odd, I mean, the teenage, mutant ninja, new, teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, um, which is a popular theme, comic book theme. Um, and when the guys had developed this concept, uh, the comic book for this, Eastman and Laird, and they're out of Massachusetts, um, when we sent the sketches in, they kept rejecting the sketches, and this has never happened on any other game that I've done. Um, we, in, in pinball, you generally, and, and I, my apologies to the ladies in here, but we generally were trying to uh, project to a, a, a male-dominated audience, and so we always, very often, have sexy ladies on there. In this one, they made me, how can I say this, uh, they made me increase the size of her chest um, twice to tell it looks like it looks now. And these were the comic book guys, but not, some, it's usually the other way around. And, you know, isn't this a little bit too sexist? Or that was sort of more what we'd, be, we'd get used to the hearing. But in this case, it was the other way. And so I just accommodated um, the, the creators of the, the comic book to, um, to do that to the, the lady on the comic book piece. So that's how it went out as a final painting. Um, this piece, I have this in here because it's, um, it's my only shot I actually have with a phantom. Uh, of the opera cabinet, which I really like. This is one of the last ones that we did as a the old-fashioned way of doing it, which is the line art and fill-in um, uh, technique. Um, the other, uh, my students often ask me when I show them this if, if I have any pants on in this picture. Uh, <laughs> the truth is, this is in my home, and I have a game room, and then there's a pool outside the game room, so I'm in swimming trunks, I assure you. And this fellow here that's playing the game, um, the little guy there, he ends up being on my last pinball machine that I'll show you when he was, I think, about um, 15 at that time, and now he's 25, so um, he, uh, so that's kind of just significant for that reason. Oh, this is, <laughs> I stuck this one in. Um, this just happened uh, four weeks ago. Um, again, the wrestling coach thing uh, is a major part of my life. As I said, it's always been as, almost as important as art. Um, the fella in the lower left-hand corner the piece there is uh, an Illinois State Wrestling Champion. He's my grandson. And um, couldn't be more proud of him because uh, I, I'm the one that got him into this sport in the first place when he was eight years old. And I felt tremendous responsibility and pressure that, for this to be a good experience for him, but it turned out to be tremendous. And, uh, and uh, I got to coach him at the, the state tournament. And after he was, he was done, he proceeded to do a backflip and then run and jump into my arms and give me a big hug. And, and, it doesn't get any better than that. So that's why I included that. But this is kind of how the whole coaching thing has come around full circle. I started out as a coach and I kind of ended up with a uh, grandson of a state champion. That's pretty fulfilling. So pretty, pretty rewarding. <laughs> OK, 
and this was my last commercial pinball. It's Twister, uh, based on the movie Twister. Um, I guess that's a Sega who was '80s before that, as you all know. Um, and again, uh, kind of a fun movie. Um, the thing I always talk about this, and this is um, what I tell my students about: when you're an artist and you're working for somebody else, um, you don't always have the creative control to do what you want to do. I mean, you're dealing with other people's opinions, other people's uh, desires for what they want. If you're doing, it, if you're a fine artist, well, go ahead and do it the way you want, and then hang it in a gallery. And if somebody wants to buy it, great. But you've done your thing. Well, in this case, the, the, the only troubling thing about doing this piece was Helen Hunt, the actress that's in this piece, was going through kind of a transformation. If she wanted to become a leading lady, more romantic type, and this was a movie that was coming out currently, but they also, her people, her managers and so on, all knew what she, the way she was trying to steer her career, um, and they made me. Every photograph I had of her, her, her eyes were very squinty, and she was looking off in the distance at tornadoes. And they made me keep opening her eyes up further and further until, in my view, it didn't even look as much like her. But she improved it. And what I notice now when I look at um, movies that she's in or even the TV shows that she's in, it's clear that she's had eye surgery. And because uh, I don't think anybody would know better than I am looking at it so closely. Um, so it, it was just something that bothered her. I will tell you this too. In all these license games that we got to do, and this I do tell my kids about this, I got to meet a lot of the, the actual stars or the talent, if you want to call it that. They are always wonderful. I mean, everybody from Elton John to um, Matt Groening, the guy that creates The Simpsons, um, um, Tim Burton. I mean, there's the, the actors. But Pierce Brosnan played me in pinball and enjoyed it. But, I mean, it's just great. Great folks. It's usually their manager around them that are trying to protect their image or you know, just looking out for their best interests. They're the, the ones that are a little tougher to deal with. But I've never met you know, any personality TV movie star, rock singer. Gene Simmons um, is, was funny, um, but he wanted to, he's a, and I didn't even do the artwork on Kiss, but I, we had to go and talk to him about it. And you know, he came up. He's in full makeup, full costume before a concert while we're looking and approving the artwork, and he wanted. Wanted to be bigger and buff, more buff, you know. And I, and I was looking right at him, you know, and it, that was not the way he really looked at the time. So he wanted to enhance his own, wanted us to enhance his, his view. But that, that's, that's the worst situation. And Dolly Parton, we did a piece for Dolly Parton, I didn't do that art also, but, I, but uh, Dave Christensen did. And she, you know, there's all kinds of things about Dolly Parton you think she might have a comment about, but at the time, she wanted her fingers longer. She, she wanted her hands to be it's not so short and stubby. So anyway, that's just kind of one of the sidelines about working with um, talented people. You know, artists are artists. And I walked into Matt Groening's office. As I walk in, he's got a Phantom of the Opera pinball in his office. And he comes up to me and shakes my hand and says, you're a genius. Now he's telling me I'm a genius. He just signed a million dollar contract with 20th Century Fox to do The Simpsons, which I think is the longest running uh, animated show on TV, his, TV history. So I'd say he's got, a, got it figured out pretty well too. Uh, okay, now this this last stuff I just kind of put in at the end here. This is stuff that I got to do as a um, video game um, box designer. You know, some of the when pinball slowed down, um, some of the people would come to me and say, "Would you do um, you know our, our packaging for some of these video games?" And this is one one of the first ones I did. It was called uh, Panic Restaurant. And I actually the reason I have these things in here is that these have been in drawers of mine for years since I did them. And a collector called me over the summer and was interested in a certain number of people. He'd done his homework and found out that I wasn't just a pinball artist, but I did video game. And asked me about specific games that if I had done the artwork and if I if I had, I sell them. And I agreed to some selling some pieces, but I hadn't ever taken any good high resolution photographs of them. So that's why I have these photos now. And this game at the time I thought wasn't a real popular game or anything, but it's I guess it's now become sort of a rare game to find in the collector's thing. So in the collector's world, this was an important piece. So he, he bought the painting. Um, and then I've got a, uh, okay, there, there it is on the box. Okay, that shows how it you know, to the box. This is another one, it was a game called Night Quest. Now I, this is an example of when you do some projects, like the project itself may not seem, like even even the um, the, what you charge for it may not be as high as you like, but you like to do it, you know, it's fun to do. This one I, I enjoyed doing. It was just a, kind of a dragon. I think it was called Dragon or Night Quest was the name of the game. Yeah, and uh, it was again for a uh, either a Game Boy or some other um, packaging, and then also for the advertisements. 
So they, because they, they used to use our artwork as part of the ads. Now with the uh, video games, so much of it comes right off the game. The game is so, so realistic and so accurate, you don't have to have somebody go out and try to paint it. Another one, I, I, don't, I can't remember the name of this game, but uh, Saint Sword, I think was the name of this one. But again, sort of that same theme. And I, again, I'm, just, I'm not saying I love any, all these so well, but I just sort of think examples of ones I did. Um, Kadash was the name of this game. Uh, I forgot, this one, I can't remember the name of this game. Um, but it was, you know, again, they have a, you submit sketches, they, you know, usually you submit three sketches of different compositions, and then they choose the one they like. It is an always, it, not, more often than not, it's not the one you like the best, but uh, this is the one that they felt worked best. Um, this was one with a, with kind of a, again, if you, there are a lot of themes in, in video games at the time, shooting games, car racing games, uh, fighting games, um, and so, you, you know, your genres were sort of similar, so you had to kind of come up with different interpretations of what you're going to paint. Um, this, this is a, a kind of a, you know, sort of semi-realistic comical version of a um, game called Toki, if I remember right. And again, I'm just showing these, I'm not saying these are my favorite pieces, but they were done. And so this is a game called Rampage, a uh, pretty popular video game. Um, that's my son standing in for the sort of Terminator-like guy uh, in the game. Um, I can't remember the name of the game. It, it, it's escaping right now, but it was a... And they did several different versions of this game, so it came out with whatever... Uh, Power Blade, it was called. Power Blade 1, Power Blade 2, and Power Blade 3. I think it was Power Blade 2. And again, this just shows you the process of what you would send a client for a game. This is a beach volley uh, video game. The, that's the sketch I sent that they actually chose. There's a revision on the face that they asked for to make it look a little happier. And then there's the final, final paint. Again, style-wise, I when I did these things, I didn't have to try to always stay the same style the whole time. I could kind of experiment a little bit, have some fun. Um, again, this is one I actually did like doing, it. back to Monsters. Um, this is actually a game that American Sammy did. And um, they had this game that they developed prior to Mortal Kombat coming out. And it was all the old traditional sort of um, raster style video characters. And what they really wanted to do, they, they knew they had a problem because Mortal Kombat changed the world, you know, in terms of how people perceive fighting games. And, um, and so what they asked me to do was create the most elaborate video cabinetry and back class and the surrounding thing to put this game in. Um, so I, and again, it was a game about, uh, it wasn't as much about zombies as it, you might think, it was called Zombie Raid. But I took, the two cabinet sides, and we made full-size cabinet artwork, and there were the same quality paintings I would do for a pinball machine. Um, so you had almost life-size versions of this Frankenstein character, and there's a, a werewolf character on the other side. But there's a, the um, full-size cabinet side on one side, and then that's the werewolf on the other side. So these are uh, these are a couple of my favorite pieces because I got to do what I wanted to do, and it was and I spent more time than you would typically do on a, uh, on a video game in terms of the art package. Okay, this is my last pinball machine. Um, and I don't know if it was a, an omen or anything, but that's my daughter is hanging out of the car on the right side, on the left side. Um, her husband, at the time, uh, is the driver. And those are my uh, two grandkids in the car, and then my wife is in the uh, front seat. And then the fellow, that, the little boy that was uh, playing the pinball machine earlier, is on the top roof of the machine, and that's my daughter's dog. My daughter and her husband are no longer together, um, and this, uh, but she is remarried, and, uh, and, uh, and, that, and that little guy, the little boy in the car right there is the fellow who just won the state wrestling championship. So, so this is a game, actually, uh, Doug Duba was here earlier, but um, his uh, dad's company is the one, uh, Roger um, did this, uh, manufactured this game, and it was actually a, a home pinball machine. Um, but it was fun to do. Uh, got to you know a lot of my own sort of input in terms of the characters, which was always fun. Okay, that's Batman. That's fine. Again, I'm out of order here because I was just taking pictures. But that's the original Batman I did um, with the um, with the Tim Burton movie for for Danny East. And this one, Roger Sharp, is he still here? Roger, recognize that? This is a game. Um, it's a redemption game that uh, Roger and I worked on together for Bromley. And it was the 25th anniversary of the Muppets, as I remember. And um, this was sort of a Halloween theme where um, obviously this, this piggy dresses up like the Bride of Frankenstein and Kermit is the Frankenstein character and so on. You know, 
So that was one of the later things that I did in the in the game business. Then in 2002, I went back into um, into teaching and um, thought I was going to keep doing all this and teach at the same time, but it, that became impossible. But uh, a couple other things, these were just some posters. This is a game, a redemption game I did for uh, American Savvy. So it just kind of shows you some of the different styles um, I was asked to do from time to time. Um, I think that might be like, okay, we're going. Um, anyway, so the, um, as I said, I've gone back into education uh, in 2002, and I'm currently still doing that. I'm getting a little, little more disillusioned with the uh, public school system, and, at least in Illinois, because um, it's, it's a very challenging time to teach the arts right now. I mean, there's so much emphasis on uh, math and science and ACT scores, and it's really hard for these kids to really get involved in, in art. It's just very tough to work it into their schedule. I will say that um, since 2002 until now, the kids I've had have been fantastic. Kids have not changed since I, I mean, there's a lot of ways they have changed, but in terms of willingness to work, willingness to try to get better and good at their work, um, it's been tremendously rewarding. I, I was telling someone earlier, I, I often say I feel like a magician who's taking, handing over the magic tricks to other magicians that then develop, and I've watched these kids um, every year we win national awards for the Scholastic Art Competition, which is the most uh, prestigious and the largest and oldest high school art competition in the country. So I've watched these kids do amazing things, and it's really rewarding. Um, I'm, as I said, I'm a little dis uh, just a little bit discouraged by some of the work that's going on that's, that's, that are facing the arts in schools right now. So I don't know how much longer I'm going to do it, but I, as long as the kids are like they have been, I, I can't imagine, other than that state championship with my grandson, I can't imagine anything more rewarding than watching kids develop this stuff that is amazing. I mean, I, if I, had, I wish I had someone that was teaching me that had my experience back when I was in, in high school because uh, I think I would have, it would take a lot less time to, to get good um, because they, uh, these kids really want to learn how to do it and do it well. So at this point, I don't know how our time is. Um, how are we doing time wise? So I, I want to open up for any, if anybody has any questions. You have 10 minutes. It's a little time for questions? Okay. Okay. Um, again, if, if anybody would like to ask any questions about anything I've shown or anything else that. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Flux. We have Toe to Green. Can I get your mic there? Sorry, Toe to Green. You showed us the back glass art. Did you do any other art for the game? I'm having trouble here because we're behind you. With Total Recall, did you do any other art other than the back glass? For? Total Recall. Total Recall, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, did, I did a play field, and it actually had two different play fields, so I, did, I didn't do all the color work on it, though, because they, I mean, they were still testing this thing, and, and you, you saw it, in the, and it was, a, it was a big monster, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah they were testing it, and I think they just determined that the, it wasn't time for, you know, market wasn't really ready for something like this at that time. But um, but again, a back class usually takes, I mean, if you're doing nothing but that piece of artwork, a back class would take about two weeks um, from it once it's approved. Again, some of the times the process is getting approvals from licensors, so that would be, um, it could be kind of challenging. But in this case, the, the artwork had all been approved, and so you work two weeks on a back class, and then, you know, then, then you go to production, you start doing the play. Actually, you get the, the play field, or the back class approved first, and then that gets the process going. Then you usually do the, we did, the play field, the cabinet, so they could start to build them up and screen them and then play them. And then we would be finishing the back class while uh, that all the other stuff was already being manufactured. So, um, yeah. Yes? And I'm not, yeah, it's, it's, uh, the reason the mic is here, there's a, that rumble of uh, games is pretty loud up here. What electronic tools do you use to do art these days? That's a great question um, because I was traditionally trained. I mean, my, I taught a lot of, the, I taught myself a lot of what I did was just by being interested as an artist. Um, these days, you almost can't avoid using some digital, like Photoshop and uh, those kind of techniques. Um, I still use a lot of the traditional techniques and then take it into Photoshop, and then if I want to modify something, I can do it in Photoshop. Like airbrushing, for example, what used to take, John Yowsey would be better to talk about this than I, even I, because he's been an airbrusher for a long time. But all 
the cutting of masks, all the um, elaborate preparation work you have to do when you airbrush, um, you know, in Photoshop, you can do that much quicker and there's no cleanup, you know, so that's kind of what some of the advantages are. But I was, uh, quite honestly, I was reluctant to embrace the um, digital, um, the whole computer thing, you know, I was definitely, it was, it, it was kind of frustrating. You, you, you know, you work on something for 20 years and develop the ability to, to do perspective accurately and everything, and here comes a software program that can do it for you, you know, and it's, um, for that reason, it can be a little frustrating, but you can't avoid it today. I tell my, all my kids that if they want to get into professional art, that be commercial art, artists, then they better get familiar with Illustrator and uh, Photoshop and, and, and learn how to use them. Yes, sir. Who is your favorite game designer, and do you have any interesting stories to share with uh, those interactions? Um, well, that's a great question. I've never been asked who's my favorite. Um, I like working with a, a lot of them. I mean, I, when I was at Data East, Joe had such a big, he was overseeing almost all the designs, you know, and he had, and, and he had other designers that were um, working with him. So, I mean, he was the, the, um, the one who was like the one that I would interact with the most, you know. But John Borg was great. Um, I, I worked with him on several pieces. Jim Padla over at, um, at uh, Valley was one of my favorites because he, What's so great about him, um, he really was a very thorough, not just game designer, but an engineer. He'd make sure that those games, would, when they hit the line, would really function. And we did a game called Centaur um, that you know was a pretty complex game, and he really shepherded that game through and made sure it worked. He was very open to um, concepts. Um, so it was great. Kamik was another one I worked a lot with at uh, Valley. Um, I'm trying to think who else that uh, stands up. Those are the three I probably did the most work with, uh, those guys. Um, but I wouldn't, you know, I never, it just, some, on some games you'd have a great experience, other games it would be less uh, successful, not just because the game was successful, but, you know, something might not, um, you just weren't as happy with the way it came out sometimes. And, um, but I, I tell you what, game designers are a special breed, They're, it's, a spe it's a, so, such a specialized industry anyway, but you're dealing with all this geometry and gameplay, and, uh, and the, the only thing I used to hate when Norm Clark used to tell me that, um, Know, do your nice artwork, but just don't make it busy. He didn't want it to be too, and that, in my view, that was didn't want it to be sophisticated or elaborate, but he wanted it to keep it simple. But he came from an era, and, and, and fair enough, um, that when you don't want to confuse the player with too many things going on in front of him. So um, I took that with a grain of salt and tried to keep it, it, it tried to make it beautiful but um, also functional. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that's a good question. Most of these that you see, um, the paintings I've shown, are actually acrylic. Um, there's only two that are up here that aren't acrylic. Acrylic is um, it's a wonderful medium. It's, if you know anything about it, it's, it's a lot of people use it today. But actually, back in the 50s is when I started using it um, as, a, as, a, as a kid. And it was very new at that time. But um, it's, it's shown it stood the test of time. The greatest thing about acrylic paint is that it dries quickly. Whereas the oil paintings that I did, I did a few, you have a longer period of drying time in between when you can go back and work on them. So they're not quite as practical in a commercial sense when you have deadlines and, and tough deadlines. So uh, the Phantom of the Opera was an oil, and I, again, they gave me enough time to, to make sure I could work it through it. And then the Paragon piece was actually, um, was, a, was a medium called um, uh, Alkid, which is similar to oil-based oil house paint. So like, almost like oil paint, but not quite. It dries a little faster. So most of them are acrylic. That's a good question. Yes, sir. I actually have two questions for you. One, I get asked a lot, I have a Back to the Future. So the question is, how did you do your model selection on the Back to the Future? Back to the Future? Yeah. Uh, and then the other question I have for you is, the process on the play field, is it design first, then the mechanics? Mechanics and then design? How great, does that work? Great question. We used to get what we called a white, a white board, a white board. And that's when the designer had gone through all the drawings, had uh, done a, um, a routed play field, built up all the parts, played it, percentaged it, and then as Norm Clark would say at the back in the Valley days, said, now it's a game. And then they would release it to us. We'd be watching that process very often. And even at Stern, I got to see the games being built before I actually was gonna get to do the art. But um, you, would, you would kind of start to think through it a little bit, and then they would work with you on what do you want the, the how do you want the lights arranged for the bonus features, and, that kind of thing. Um, but now, what was the first part of your question? The what? The back of the future. Oh yes. <laughs> um, back to the future. We, 
I, we did a game called Back to the Future for the 80s. We went out to, this is where Joe Camico first got it connected with all the Hollywood um, licensors and uh, really loved that process. But this was the first one. Bob Gale, he became personal friends with Bob Gale. Um, long story short is we did the artwork and we were told to go ahead and use the characters. Michael J. Fox at the time either was holding out for more money or just did not want to approve that he, I guess his concern was, you know, as a kind of diminutive actor, he was worried about being Marty McFly the rest of his career if you if you kind of license that. Now, at least that's what they told us. So, I mean, they weren't going to stop the game. It's still, um, uh, Christopher Lloyd is still the doctor on the game, and, 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 but my son, my, one of my models, um, stood in for Michael J. Fox and did the uh, modeling for that, and I just put his face on the, on the game, game, and everybody was happy. One other game that happened with, too, was Hook. I did a game called Hook, and it had Robin Williams and, um, uh, who was the, uh, oh, Dustin Hoffman, yeah, like, uh, they were the characters on the game. Um, and again, they, they were getting pretty savvy about this time, or, they, or their people were savvy about what a license agreement would look like and how much they should get, and they were negotiating that, and Gary Stern, I think, just said, no, we're not doing it, we're not gonna you know, play this game. So Gary Stern is the Captain Hook character, that's uh, Dustin Hoffman, and uh, Joe Caminco is the Peter Pan character that's flying above. But I mean, from the view you see it, you really, can't really tell that much, but but I mean we weren't allowed to use them, so we had to we worked around it. So okay, any other questions? Okay, well it's great to see everybody, and this is this show is fantastic. I hope you enjoy the rest of the time here. Those games on the floor look, tre look tremendous. Really takes me back because they're in such great condition. So thank you very much.